Larry, my name is Catherine Kanayao with Enhancing Montana's Wildlife and Habitat, and I would like to thank you for the opportunity to interview you on behalf of hunting, angling, and non-hunting conservation perspective. I see that you were a state representative in the Montana State House of Representatives from 2001 to 2006, and a state senator for us from 2006 to 2014. You were also an attorney and uh, sole practitioner uh, as an attorney law, and you were a fishing guide with Bad Lily's Trout Shop and Ray's Tackle Shop from 1980 to 1983. I'd like it if you could take a few moments and introduce yourself to the public. I was raised in Tennessee, and uh, mostly in East Tennessee, and grew up in a hunting and fishing family. I uh, spent a lot of time on my grandfather's small farm that borders the Smoky Mountain National Park. I was a Boy Scout and hiked and camped and, and fished all over the park in the Cherokee National Forest when I was little and when I was growing up. I was an athlete in high school, not a very good one, but enough to survive the admissions process and uh, uh, four years of West Point. And after graduating from West Point, where at, at West Point I probably pioneered some things there. I was the president of the they called it the Outdoor Sportsman's Club. It was the Cadet Rod and Gun Club. But I bow hunted there and uh, um, hunted when I had time and uh, pretty much knew every inch of the reservation by the time I graduated. First duty station was Alaska. Um, fished up there, shot a doll sheep, caught some salmon. I was an infantry officer, spent uh, three winters in the field. Um, you don't, in Alaska, they don't count years, it's how many winters you've spent. Um, qualified for Special Forces training and went to Fort Bragg for however many months that was and then after graduation went to Fort Devens. So I got a chance to on weekends to uh, uh, bum around New England uh, in New Hampshire and Vermont particularly and see some of that country before I got out of the service and came out here of course after active duty. I'm a Bullhunter Ed instructor, fly tire, not, not much recently, but was when I was younger. Um, bird hunter, um, like to do, basically like to do it all. Went to law school at the University of Colorado at Boulder, and partly because of the natural resource law program there, and partly because um, it's a good school, and partly because, of course, it's Colorado. <laughs> and on March 31st, 1980, a number of hunters and anglers began addressing our public access to state lands. Tony Schooneman, Jack Atchison Sr., and Jack Jones formed and filed the Montana Coalition for Access on State Public Lands. And then in 1988, this coalition filed a lawsuit against the state for hunting and fishing access to state lands. Later in 1993, the State Land Board was petitioned to expand the multiple use policy to include hiking, camping, berry picking, mushroom hunting, and bird watching. Now, if elected as the Attorney General of Montana, you would become an automatic land board member. So how important to you would this position be? How much time would you potentially devote to it? And what would your approach to a seat on the Montana State Land Board be? My approach is that the state lands are for everybody, not just the people who happen to be uh, leasing and making money off those state lands. We've come a long way since 1980 in uh, public land issues generally. You know, that's the year I started law school. You look at Colorado now, and you look at Montana now, there's just no difference. There is no trout fishing industry in Colorado because you can't get to, get to nothing worth fishing, basically. And uh, that's the difference between the two states. You know, now you can, uh, you look at my, this is actually my pile of hunting licenses and tags, and I, it does go in my wallet. But part of what's in my wallet, I don't have a Capital One card, but I have a, a license that allows me to hunt and fish on state lands. Awesome. <laughs> and, and that's, and that's uh, meaningful to me as a potential member of the land board. Mm -hmm. And so I'm always going to remember what's in my wallet if I get to be on the land board. Excellent, excellent. I was involved in a situation here um, protecting our Durfee Hills, our BLM land in Fergus County, uh, which is uh, home to an incredible elk herd and the habitat, the breeding habitat for them. 
the Wilkes brothers moved in from out of state and started buying increasing amounts of land. And when they didn't get the Durfee Hills in an initial exchange conversation, they proceeded to illegally fence around our BLM lands without authorization. This was a high type five wire fence. I think at the lowest at level, it was uh, nine inches off of the ground and up to 54 inches up at the top. I started looking into cases of the Unlawful Enclosures of Public Lands Act, and that brought me to the Red Rim case in Wyoming that involved antelope. Now, you had your law degree at the University of Colorado, and you took natural resource law. You mentioned that you were an intern on the U.S. versus Lawrence Red Rim case. Can you expound on that? Um, this would have been in the spring semester 1983. I was one of the student interns uh, working for Bob Golden who was a staff attorney at the Wildlife Federation Law Clinic, and I did work some on the Red Rim case. And the Red Rim is a unique place. The antelope in Wyoming and Colorado, just like they do in Montana, they migrate a very long way, and they have to do that. Uh, all antelope herds are migratory, as we know, but these guys go, go literally hundreds of miles. And when they get up on that area, um, this, guy had a, this guy had some kind of a fence. It was a... Uh, a fence that um, kept kept antelope out mm -hmm. and and deferred or deflected the migration for a very long distance. And they were piling up dead along yeah, the fence line they couldn't yeah. get through in the winter. And I'd like to discuss stream access now. In 1991, the American Lawyer publication, you were quoted concerning attorney Jim Getz's reputation of quote, lost causes that turned out to be not so lost. And part of this involves stream access here in Montana. Can you tell us how you feel about stream access? Yeah, the, the association with Jim, he's my neighbor now. When I got out of the Army in 1978, I, I took some courses at Montana State I because I, I looked at medical school. So I took organic chemistry and stuff. And, you know, if benzene was a gas, I'd probably be your brain surgeon right now. But uh, fortunately, it's not and I'm not. So I, I looked... Um, I looked at other career choices and I wandered into this environmental law class uh, taught by this local radical lawyer guy, you know, that did environmental law and I was fascinated by it. And I was a little late getting into the, the class and he uh, talked to him and he said, well, you, you, you can get into class. And it was a big influence on me about going to law school. That was the tipping point about going to law school uh, was, was Jim's class. And, and the reason it was is because Law what became not just something that you did so you could live in Bozeman, Montana, but it became a way to do something with your life as a student, you know, whether it was uh, take up a, a lost cause, uh, to uh, uh, passionately believe in something, to enter public service like I did. Um, so that was sort of the genesis for that statement. But about that same time, stream access law was evolving. There was a Dearborn River case, and when mm -hmm. I was in his class, he was working on the Dearborn River case. And the Dearborn River case is, and along with, uh, I think, the Beaverhead and others, were cases that led to the principle in Montana uh, that, that because of the public nature of our waters, uh, that the people and not the landowners own the stream bed. It's different in other states. And that's why... Um, you know, we have so much to cherish and so much to lose if the, if the wrong people are in public office, whether it's in the legislature, land board, Supreme Court, or so forth. Mm -hmm. And that law, isn't, that law started out as case law, as you know, mm -hmm. Catherine, and later became codified when I was a state legislator 20 years later. So in 1980, it's an evolving principle. Mm -hmm. And some people think, this is a little bit crazy, you know, I mean, uh, you know that uh, this, this isn't going to happen, the Supreme Court's not going to bite on this, and you know it's a very conservative state and so forth. But, but in fact, uh, the right ruling happened in 1980, and there's a series of controversies, but by the time I ran successfully for the Montana House 20 years later, this is accepted as part of the Montana ethos, it's who we are. And, and so that's why when you get an, almost another 20 years forward to today, you know, you see where we've come. And one of the big issues in this election is uh, public access. And part of it is because of the power of the, uh, the huge out-of-state landowners 
that can not only buy ranches in the plural, but can buy an election. It just so happens that the Wilkes brothers contributed to my opponent when he made his race to be Attorney General. I'd like to talk about hunting legislation now. In 2003, HB 101, which you sponsored, allowed FWP to issue licenses by telephone and internet or other electronic means, but it also toughened the law against non-residents illegally caught with a resident license. In that same year, the Montana Game Warden Association also named you the Legislator of the Year. Would you like to comment on that? Um, on the internet licensing, I was probably the last guy in America to get the internet, at least in the Montana legislature. <laughs> so I, I, I gave him a pretty high hurdle. I said, if I'm, you're going to sponsor this bill, I have to be able to order my tags online. <laughs> and I did. So uh, the, that degree of user friendliness is pretty strict standard. Uh, they, they exceeded and, meet that, and beat that, and I think that's significant. The other part of the, some of the tagging laws I worked on, had to do with people, there were a rash of incidents where uh, some involved outfitters and some did not. And by the way, the Montana Outfitters Association has consistently supported me on these, um, these uh, efforts to clean up the outfitting industry. But you'd have people, you know, with a bunch of tags in their pocket and, uh, you know, so they could, you know, pick and choose an animal or take over the limit or, or whatever. And, and so that's why we did that. You, had, you, can, you can't be running around with somebody else's tags. And um, so if a guy wants to shoot an elk and sees a, sees a bigger one or whatever the number of possibilities might be there. And <clears throat> I'd also worked on some other things leading up to that, uh, the game warden trainee bill. And I got a story about that too. Uh, I was out on the Madison River fishing an otter nymph one day. And a um, guy came along, I looked, there's somebody watching me up on the hill. And that's now, I think he's Captain Shaw now, Kevin Shaw. And he was at that time a game warden trainee. And he came and introduced himself, and I didn't know this trainee program existed. Um, I was fascinated by that, enough to work. I applied for that, also applied for law school. Um, he was so good at what he did and presented the department so well that I'd always been interested in wildlife law enforcement. When I got to the legislature, I found out that the trainee program had languished, and so I reinstated it, and it exists to this day here and at UM. At one time, over about close to 60% of all the wardens were graduates of the trainee program, where they would work for Fish and Game as interns their last year. Our wardens just don't go, you know, get a degree and put on a badge. Not only do they have to be trained in the field, um, but they also have to be certified as peace officers. I wrote that legislation too about the peace officers' uh, standards and training, the post council board, about, about how we do that. And so one of my biggest legislative regrets is that I didn't figure out a way to do what I did for game wardens that I did for highway patrolmen, which is to conduct a salary survey and get them up to market standard. And that's, that's got to be a priority. Exactly. Uh, we, for, we need our next, game wardens to have yeah. competitive wages, yeah. living wages here yeah, in Montana. They need to be competitive, and they're not. Mm -hmm. the, the main implement in that, the main impediment of that, is the Montana Public Employees Association. The Public Employees Association is so wedded to the collective bargaining process and that everybody, from top to bottom, gets whatever it is, two point something percent, and they are so jealous of what I did with highway patrolmen, they just can't stand it. And that and organized labor is directly responsible for the loss of trained Montana game wardens today. Next subject I'd like to bring up is bridge access. Now recently the PLWA has been in an ongoing um, litigation concerning bridge access. And in this particular case, this was o over at the Sailor Lane Bridge. Mm -hmm. um, Devlin Geddes, their attorney, wrote a letter to Attorney General Tim Fox requesting his help 
uh, in this aspect and stated that intervention by the Attorney General's office is necessary because Madison County has adopted a litigation strategy that appears to be aimed at unreasonably narrowing the scope of the bridge at Sailor Lane. Given the state of Montana's interest in the safety of the public on its roadways and bridges, PLWA believes the State Attorney General's office is better suited to represent the interest of the public and Madison County in determining the, quote, reasonably necessary and convenient width of the Sailor Lane right-of-way at Sailor Bridge. I bring this up because Attorney Generals have the, the right to make opinions, and those opinions are counted as law until they are either overturned in court or replaced by legislation. So my question to you, because I know that you dealt with voting for SB 78 in 2007, which affirmed stream access and brought in bridge access, and then again, bridge access was brought up in the 2009 legislation, House Bill 190, which thankfully became law. Um, how would you address a situation like this if the public came to you and requested your intervention on behalf of the safety and the access first, of the public? I, I do things. First, I would, I would do, you know, the, the statute on the, the county attorneys and the attorney general clearly gives the attorney general supervisory powers over the county attorneys and says that it, quote, may, may direct the attorney general, the county attorneys, uh, to, to file cases or to not file cases. So there's a, some supervisory authority that, that exists under the law passed by the legislature that says this is what the Attorney General does. Um, and second, the Attorney General opinions do have the force of law, so you could issue an opinion saying essentially Madison County's position was contrary to SB 78 and the, the statute that was promulgated there under. And, and third, you could come in and have your lawyers take the place of the lawyers for the county in and, 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 and order to, if those lawyers aren't carrying out the will of the people as expressed through the legislature and the laws and the, and the court decisions. So there's actually a lot Attorney General can do. The Attorney General is an officer in the executive branch. The key thing about the executive branch, whether it's the governor who runs most of the executive branch, or the Attorney General who's elected to run independently, you understand, to run the, the Department of Justice. The key thing about executive power is it's the power to decide. And the Attorney General has the power to decide what to pursue, what not to pursue. And in this case, this particular Attorney General has not pursued public access for sportsmen or any other Montanans during his term. And I think that's wrong. I'd, be, I'd do it different if I was in there. Yes, we have a, a number of cases of illegal access that has been cut off uh, to our public lands in a, a number of forms and on public access county roads. And in this particular case, with the appeal to uh, get involved in this case at the Sailor Lane Bridge, he declined. He did not respond to this and he did not intervene on behalf of the public. So I, I thank you for um, mentioning that this is not only a, a right, it's a responsibility it's of your office. It's a responsibility, and that responsibility, you have a, a great deal of discretion. That's one of the reasons that the AG's the office, the Attorney General is a great office. It's a cool office because it has a lot of power. But with that power comes responsibility, how are you going to use it or not use it. Exactly. You have also mentioned in an article I read, supporting clean energy technologies. Now, in the Montana Environmental Information Center, on their legislative voting record, uh, you received 100% in 2011 and 92% in 2013. And I'd like to give you an opportunity to discuss uh, your views because clearly this is part of a controversy with Montana, but we are poised to have the economy, which is a, a growing job um, providing economy in green energy technologies. Yeah, I think that first, to, to, first by talking about coal, you know, coal's not going to go away anyway soon, but uh, coal is coal is on the decline because of market forces. Most of these coal generating plants are going to be in the country are going to be taken over by natural gas. There's no reason you can't retrofit coal strip to natural gas to something clean. But on the the topic of alternatives, 
you know, we made great progress, although there's still a lot of things to be done, whether it's increasing the, the portfolio, that is, the, the percentage of, of the electricity that has to come from clean power, or just giving homeowners a break. This, there's a constant fight with the power company and people out here in my Senate district that have solar power and what they get when they sell the solar power back to the utility when they generate mm -hmm. too many electrons or vice versa when it comes back the other way. And we debated that. I think we debated that in 2013 too. It came up almost every session. Was, uh, I'm not sure how much of the Attorney General job affects this other than you know just the, uh, the basic philosophy of clean power. We need to keep we need to keep uh, driving it and encouraging it. Back to the uh, ag opinions. You mean you, AG, Attorney General opinions? Yes, Attorney General opinions. Okay. Utah State Attorney General supports the transfer of our federal public lands to the states, and they've written an official position concerning that. Now, since an Attorney General's opinion functions as law until it is overturned in court or replaced by legislation, I would like to know what your opinions are of a federal transfer of public lands to the states. Oftentimes they're projecting selling those to private individuals so they would be privatized. But what would you do if the legislature passed such a proposal? I would not defend it. They're on their own. Period. Concerning the rights, you recently wrote an article uh, as a guest opinion in uh, concerning a deer lodge case in the surrounding communities. Now, as a conservation hunter and angler, and, and very much involved in public trust issues, I have uh, actually been told I could not attend public meetings. I have submitted official public information requests to a number of our agencies here in Montana and have had those ignored or declined. Concerning the Montana's right of participation, the open meeting laws, the public's right to know, I noticed in your article you were talking about the decisions concerning this, the widespread public interest concerning a controversy involving a particular class or group of citizens. Uh, you stated, had the AG followed the law on public participation, the reasons for this move would have evaporated. It is ironic that the AG, whose opinions have the force of law, did not take the time to read a little of it before he made his this decision. Can you expound on that? Yeah, yeah what they did, they just moved the, they just decided they're going to move everybody out of Deer Lodge. It's been there a hundred years and it's important to the town. And, uh, Deer Lodge is not a very big town. Uh, a lot of things have been moved out of there. It's basically the prison, the DMV, the spinoff stuff from the prison, uh, a little bit of railroad and ag and timber, and that's about it. And, uh, so they were upset, and uh, the, the reasons given for the move was efficiency and uh, cost, and the cost reason turned out to not exist. The landlord had no uh, intention of raising the rent. Um, the, there was no efficiency that could be proven to moving those people to Helena. And many of them had worked, most of them had worked whole careers there, I guess, in Deer Lodge. And so uh, they were going to have to either move to Helena, or make a 100 mile drive over McDonald Pass, including in the winter and, and you know, lousy weather. So it was a bad deal for them. But the, the reasons given by the, the Department of Justice when they did their press release were, were found out to be totally bogus. And had there been a public meeting or public comment, that would have come out if it had been a proposal and then an action. They just did it. And I think it shows some arrogance on the part of the DOJ, the part of the Department of Justice, and the Attorney General for just ignoring the people in Deer Lodge. Um, the point is about the Constitution is that there's two main provisions. One of them is the uh, open meeting law. Mm -hmm. So if you have uh, a city council or the Fish and Game Commission or a legislative committee, those meetings have to be open to the public. And not only that, they have to be noticed to the public. So there's a reasonable amount of time where people can get to the meeting that is open. And the second prong of that, that's one of them's Article 2, Section 8, and the other one's Article 2, Section 9. And that's public participation. That has to do with the executive branch. And the executive branch, that's what's implicated here, um, has to give some sort of reasonable notice under certain conditions set by the legislature. That is, if there's a significant controversy, 
affects a large number of people, etc. They're listed in the law. And that didn't happen here. And for sportsmen wanting to study this, this is a good case study and and this in this instance how things are not work, but implicating all those laws and uh, uh, third one of course is uh, doing a freedom of information request. That's a that's not a meeting thing, that's a document thing. If somebody's got a document going back and forth. I've made public information requests and um, sometimes I've received them, other times they've obstructed those. In this particular case, uh, MEIC sued the Attorney General Tim Fox. This was in 2014 for public documents um, to be released and when they finally did get those documents after the lawsuit, they were so heavily redacted. So my question to you is concerning openness of government and transparency. How, what is your perspective on that? I think the, you know, the Constitution and the statutes lay it out pretty well. Um, anything you try to hide, you're going to get, you're going to fork over anyhow under our system of government in Montana, so why bother? Because the courts will make, will, unless there's some employee <coughs> privacy thing implicated, ultimately the courts will order, order it disclosed. Now I'd like to discuss an economic perspective because outdoor recreation is one of the largest economic drivers here in Montana, one of the largest industries. In a Conservation in the West poll, they listed that 63% of Montanans are sportsmen with close to half, 47% saying they're both hunters and anglers. Uh, they also listed that two-thirds of Montana voters visit public lands six or more times per year, with 38% visiting more than 20 times per year. Per year, so a number of Montanans that frequent in this visitor category is nearly double that of any other Western state, with the exception of Wyoming. In another uh, outdoor recreation economy, they listed that outdoor recreation in Montana generates 5.8 billion in consumer spending. They listed 64,000 direct Montana jobs, 1.5 billion in wages and salaries and 403 million in state and local tax revenue. Clearly this is a not just a lifestyle, this is a major economic driver in Montana. So looking forward, do you see your position as Attorney General in being crucial or effective in maintaining this way of life and this aspect of our economy? I think so. And I think it's important to emphasize that this is not just an important office because of the land board, but it's a powerful office, and the powers of the attorney general, including include the power, you know, quite simply to to file an action to ask a court to order access that's been closed. Um, the uh, attorney general, um, as you said, can do attorney general's opinions on all sorts of legal issues that come up, but. The main thing people need to know who the Attorney General is, if he cares about the same kind of stuff that they like to do. You know, it depends on who's pulling the strings. You know, if the coal and the oil and gas industry are pulling the strings on what the person in this office does, uh, you know, that bodes ill for sportsmen and wildlife too. So I think there's a clear choice in this election, and uh, the choice just doesn't implicate what we care about. It, it implicates. Uh, um, our economy down the road 10, 20 years from now. Which brings me to one of my last points is that in Montana we have seen there was an investigation concerning dark money in election processes here in Montana and they're targeting key positions uh, from our legislators and our other governmental offices. I would like to know your opinion concerning dark money, outside influences trying to change and affect Montana to more of a privatization, and Citizens United. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a mouthful, so I'll start with dark <laughs> money. You know, the legislature has um, passed the Disclose Act, so for a certain period of time before anybody spends money has to disclose who they are and who gave them money and so forth. And that'll have at least some effect, but ultimately it comes back to Citizens United because all this money in politics, uh, most of it that gets raised by us is to combat some independent expenditure that we don't know about from somebody we don't, don't know from out of state. Um, that's the Citizens United effect. They used to know who 
you know, what you were fighting against, you know, in an election. That's not true anymore. Um, Citizens United allowing unlimited corporate donations to be used for um, independent expenditures is the is the is the spark. It's the it's the matchstick, and we got an interesting situation right now. When Steve Bullock was Attorney General, he appealed the Montana case and argued that Citizens United should be overturned, and he got four votes. You need five, and the fifth vote, the vote against him. Justice Scalia, he's dead. Depends on who's on the Supreme Court, of course, and uh, what they think, but I think there's an excellent chance to get Citizens United overturned, and I think it's an excellent chance if I get this good, that this job, I'm going to be in the uh, catbird seat to do it. And so so that's one of the reasons I'm excited about running for this deal. I mean, this this could happen. This could happen. It could, could happen because of Montana's strict disclosure laws, and we could argue that they are valid, should be upheld because Citizens United should go away. So do you have any request or uh, statement that you would like to make to the public, uh, especially the conservation public uh, at large, uh, about why they should vote for you? I think it starts at the very beginning. All my life I've been taken by the wonder and magic of wild things and wild places. That's why I'm here. That's why they're here. And that's what they ought to think about when they think about who they need to vote for for this job. Thank you, Larry. I greatly appreciate it.